morning, I'll be reading from Psalm 24. Our first song, Give Us Clean Hands, is based off this psalm, a psalm of David. So it's Psalm 24, I'll read verses 3 through 6. <coughs> Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not appealed to what is false and who has not sworn deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who inquire of him, who seek the face of God of Jacob. Please rise with us as we sing. We bow our hearts, we bend our knees. O oh, Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things. O oh, Lord, we cast down our idols. Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another give us clean hands give us pure hearts let us not lift our souls to another oh god let us be a generation that seeks seeks your face oh god of jacob oh god that seeks, seeks your face, O God of Jacob. We bow our hearts, we bend our knees, O Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things. Oh Lord, we cast down our idols. Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Oh God, let us be a generous your face, O oh God of Jacob. O oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, seeks your face, O oh God of Jacob. Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts, let us not Lift our souls to another. Join us in singing, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise. The glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of Thy name. Jesus, the name that calms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears, tis life and health and peace. He breaks the power of canceled sin, he sets the prisoner free. His 
His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. Hear him, ye deaf, his praise, ye dumb, your loosened tongues employ. Ye blind, behold, your Savior come, and leap ye lame for joy. Let's pray for the offering. Lord, we long for a thousand tongues to sing your praises, and we ask that um, our offering would be towards that goal that you would um, use these ties and gifts um, to further your kingdom here on earth, and that you would give us opportunities in this church to be a part of your mission, to use this money wisely to bring your kingdom here. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We invite you to stand and join us in singing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly seated. Well, good morning, church family. There you go, no problem. And happy Mother's Day, like Stephanie said. Um, just a wonderful time during the year to uh, focus on the mothers we have, the, the mothers we are, and um, the children that we have, and just thank the Lord for all of that that he gives us, and uh, I just want to thank you all for the mothers that you are and the mothers that you have, and I uh, hope that we can thank the Lord together in that this morning. Um, I would like to invite Sid and Susan up at this time. Uh, we've got an exciting morning for them. They had a, uh, a wedding for one of their sons, a graduation for another one of their sons coming up, and they thought, why not throw in some even more big events and, and officially become members of the church today. Now, that's not actually why they, they wanted to. Uh, Sid, this is his home. It's been for a long time. This is where he grew up. Uh, he has even served as a deacon in here. But uh, they don't just look to the past and say, oh, these are the ties with it that we have. They look at the church family right now, and they say, we want to be a part of that. They look forward, and they say, this is where we want to live out um, walking with the Lord and being in his church family. This is our church family. And so this is just an opportunity that we have to welcome them in and officially, um, you know, give our hooray and approval for that as members ourselves. So um, for our custom, we take a vote just to welcome them in and, and make sure that we're all on board with them being a part of this church family. So uh, I think there are 10 in this room that we can vote with. And uh, so all in favor of welcoming Sid and Susan as members say aye. aye. All right, all opposed say nay, no nays. All right. Um, so this, of course, is Sid and Susan. Remember them, and when you see them, pray for them. Um, benefit from their gifts. Uh, use your gifts to serve them as they do the same for you. We say this morning that we as a church family take responsibility for them, and they take responsibility for us. And uh, as a, a celebratory way of starting that out, I, we just want to pray for them now together. So Lord, we pray for Sid and Susan and their growing family and their marriages um, and just the graduations and all the exciting life things that they have going on. Um, Lord, we're overjoyed that um, added to those things is this expanding church family and the way that you've welcomed them in here, the way that they have uh, returned here and welcomed back to you but they have always felt to be their home. Lord, we, we thank you for them and the gifts that you've given them, the ways that they've served in the past, 
um, the ways that they serve us now today in um, getting to know them. Lord, we pray that we would continue to pray for them and lift them up, encourage them, um, rejoice with them when they rejoice, and mourn with them when they mourn. And Lord, uh, we just pray for their future here and our, our, our present lives together, and we praise you for it. And we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Give a big round of applause. Thank you, guys. All right. Do we have any kids to dismiss to the back? They're in the back. They're in the back. We're okay. Them up on the way to the, uh, oh, okay. All right. Gotcha. Yeah. So they get a special experience this morning as well. All right. Well, um, I do want to, you know, thank the people who helped with the Walk for Life event or supported or anything like that. Nayeli did such a good job with the posters that we actually got an award for the most spirited team. We've got the little trophy out in the entryway. So be sure to thank her next time you see her. And um, just thank you to all you guys for all the ways that you serve and the things that you do. Uh, it's usually the case in small churches that you got 10% of the people doing 90% of the work, but I think everybody here who is committed here is doing something, if not multiple things. And that is just an awesome thing to see, and we couldn't have the church run without what everybody does. So thank you all for what you do. Um, just a couple of reminders, there's no groups tonight, no community groups, and there weren't any this morning. We're in a transition now as we transition our series, so do stay tuned as we figure out more of those details of what to do next and how to do next as we talk with more of you on your feedback of what serves you, what serves our community. Uh, but for now, we're on a little bit of a break, so use that to refresh with your families um, and uh, be, stay in tune for what we have coming up. But one of the things we have coming up next week, there is the church lunch next week. Uh, so fried chicken, I'm very excited about that. Be sure to sign up on your way out, also in the entryway, just for other things that you can bring uh, to join in for the meal. Um, it's definitely a highlight of each week for me, um, no matter who we've gotten here and um, you know, what it looks like on Sunday for me to be able to open the Word of God with you and just let it speak to both of us, to all of us together. Uh, the question, though, now that we've wrapped up with Ecclesiastes is what to open now, where we go from here. And we're getting to that time where the summer break is on the horizon. Uh, the travel plans are starting to solidify. The camps and the weddings and the seasonal jobs and so on sort of scatter us, as you can see. And I'm going to have an honest pastor moment with you right now. This is often the time when churches just sort of buckle down and ride it out and stay a little bit more low-key until everybody gets back together. You know, fall is usually when we push for our programs, and the summer is like the in-between time. That's usually how it goes. And I don't know if it's just the rebel in me, but I don't, I don't think it should really be that way. And I'm not saying you shouldn't take your family vacation or we're going to start six new groups next week. I'm just saying I don't want to wait until we can get a steady momentum again to feel like we're in 100% gospel mission mode. Do you know what I'm saying? So I realize, what if instead of viewing our summer scattering as a setback, we viewed it as a send-out? What if, instead of thinking of our programs here as the places where ministry happens, we viewed our whole family here as the ministers, like Ephesians says, who get to go out and be on mission in all the different places that we're going to where the rest of us can't be? That's why we're starting a new series today called On Mission. Over the next month, we're going to get to hear from missionaries in Sweden. Uh, we're going to have some guest preachers. We're going to ordain the new deacons that we have in the church. But in all the things that we're doing, all those different things, what ties it together is this focus of being on mission together, all of us together. And remember, our church mission statement is to equip each other with the light of Christ so that we can show it to those around us. And it's that showing it to those around us part that we get to hone in on for the next little while here. So before we hear from those other ministers in the weeks ahead, later on, we get to kick off this On Mission series in the book of Jonah. What is God's mission in this world? Does it really matter how we fit into it if we've already made it into that kingdom of God? 
if we've if, if we're already connected to Jesus, can't we live it to, leave it to those missionaries in Sweden and those deacons to do the radical Christian stuff of trying to spread the gospel? And what does it matter for you this morning? Well, please turn to the book of Jonah with me. Uh, it's towards the end of the Old Testament. After Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, and you got Jonah. You can find it on page 821 if you just want to grab a pew Bible around you. Page 821, the book of Jonah, starting in the first verse. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Get up, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because their evil has come up before me. Jonah got up to flee to Tarshish, from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to recenter and refocus this morning on you and your mission. And Lord, I pray for those who have already scattered and gone, for those who get to hear this online, and for those of us here this morning, that we would all get to refocus on you and what you care about and your goals. And I pray that you'd get us to reframe the next weeks coming up, the travel plans we have, as opportunities to be sent out rather than waiting periods. And Lord, we look to you to do that work in us this morning, to grow us, to challenge us where we need it, to comfort us where we need it all through your word and by the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Now the first two verses of what we just heard are very expected, very typical for what you would get in a prophet book of the Bible. It's what happens after that that is completely off the rails. The word of the Lord came to Jonah saying, Rise, go to Nineveh, confront them. And Jonah rose and fled to Tarshish. God says, go to Argentina, and Jonah books a flight for the North Pole. I mean, I cannot emphasize enough just how crazy this is. It'd be like if they came out with a new Star Wars movie, and you got all hyped up, and you went in there to see it, and the first five minutes of the movie, the Jedi walks over to the Sith Lord, hands over his lightsaber, and says, I'm done. You can just have, I mean, look at that thing, it's dangerous. You'd be like, "What, what am I even watching right now? Okay, that's Jonah. This book refuses to let us get comfortable with it. And this is just verse 3. God calls Jonah to go to Nineveh to call them out, to be the Lord's messenger and say, hey, your wickedness has risen up before him. He sees it. And Jonah thinks, "Mm, what's the best possible way for me not to do that? You know, what, what if I just avoided God's presence altogether? Can I do that? Let's try God calls Jonah to get up to proclaim that the wickedness of those people has risen up to the Lord and Jonah goes down to Joppa, the airport, the dock. He goes down into the boat. And we just kind of assume when we're talking about being on mission for God that the people who need to be doing that are doing it, right? The prophets in the Old Testament deliver God's message. That's just what they do. But what happens when they don't? What happens when God says, go upward and outward, and they go inward and downward? What happens when God says, go and make disciples of all nations, Christian, everyone, be a part of this mission, to spread the good news of Christ, build up your church family, share the gospel in your communities, and we say, yeah, that's cool. I actually really like my view from here. God, keep it up, looking great. Actually, just leave me alone. But I would never tell you that, God. That's just what I'm thinking, and that's just how I'm acting. What happens then? Let's keep reading. Verse 4. But the Lord threw a great wind onto the sea, they're all on the boat, and such a great storm arose that the sea, on the sea that the ship threatened to break apart. 
The sailors were afraid and each cried out to his God. They threw the ship's cargo into the sea to lighten the load. Meanwhile, Jonah had gone down to the lowest part of the vessel and had stretched out and had fallen into a deep sleep. The captain approached him and said, What are you doing sound asleep? Get up! Call to your God. Maybe this God will consider us, will notice us, and we won't perish. Jonah goes down even lower and falls asleep at the bottom of a boat headed to Tarshish. But the God who called him up and out, who it turns out can't actually be avoided, causes a storm so severe that it says the ship was planning on breaking apart. And Jonah, who refused to embrace the mission that God gave him, wakes up from his bunker and immediately hears the call again, coming from the lips of a pagan sailor, Get up! Call out! The captain says. It's the same commands that Jonah gets in verse 2. What are you doing sleeping? Are you nuts? I used to... I used to think that Jonah booking a ticket to Tarshish was the most insane part of the book until I really saw this. Who was Jonah, the Israelite, supposed to be God's messenger for? We're a small but mighty crowd. Come on, any thoughts? Who was he supposed to be a messenger for? Non-Israelites, the Ninevites. I, I didn't stage her to do that, but thank you, Stephanie. Okay, The outside non-Israelites who worshipped other gods and did all sorts of nasty things, right? And now, Jonah tries his best to run away from that, but the, the second he wakes up from his sleep, one of those outside non-Israelite other God-worshipping people who didn't know the real God stares him in the face, yelling at him, Hey you, tell us who you are and what's going on with you. Call out to your God for us, because maybe he can save us. Maybe we won't perish because of him. Like, wow. God is so much more passionate about his mission than we are. He is so much better at it than we are, so much so that he will even just hand us opportunities on a silver platter right in front of us when we run from them. Has anyone had that happen? I have. I start thinking that the good news of Jesus spreading that, growing his church, expanding his kingdom are all up to my skills and people's performances and then my skill and performance is completely embarrassing or shamefully missing and God makes the spread of the gospel happen anyway in spite of me and I get to see it right in front of me it's as sobering as the storm itself I think if you put yourself in the shoes of Jonah God will not let us stop his mission and if we're not going to say okay yes here I am, Lord, use me however you want in that, then it could be he just works in spite of us and uses that to call us back to him. I mean, do you hear the irony in what the captain called out to Jonah, what he pleads for? Maybe your God will take notice of us, he screams over the waves. But who is not giving notice to who? The irony is we serve a God who does not stop noticing. A God who cares too much about the lost, the perishing, the outsiders, to let us ignore them. To let us ignore him. Let's keep reading in verse 7. Come on, the sailors said to each other, let's cast lots. Then we'll know who is to blame for this trouble we're in. So they cast lots, and the lot singled out Jonah. They said to him, tell us who is to blame for this trouble we're in. What is your business? Where are you from? What is your country? What people are you from? Do you see what I mean? He answered them, I'm a Hebrew. I worship the Lord, Yahweh, the God of the heavens, who made the sea and the dry land. 
Then the men were seized by a great fear and said to him, What is this you've done? The men knew he was freeing from the Lord's presence because Jonah had told that to them. It seems like the sailors are a lot better at responding to the real God than Jonah is. Even though Jonah knew the right information about him first. Oh, but we're so civilized. We have all our ducks in a row because we check the box that says Christian on all the forms that we have to fill out. and We, we know the right information. We're so much better than all these, these lost people that need me to go talk to them. And you think that sleeping in the bunkers, but then you participate in this mission that God sends us on and you realize how much people respond to God when He's at work and you realize, man, God cares so much more. He cares about so much more than just me having my facts straight. God really is someone to be in awe over, to revere, who's at work, who's not impressed with my Israelite birth certificate alone or my membership roles alone, you would think that God would use the prophet to call the sailors back to him. But God uses the sailors to call the prophet back to him. Be careful if you think God's not concerned about you because you're on the right side and you know all the right things. God cares. Verse 11, let's see more of how the Lord works out his mission in spite of Jonah. So the sailors said to Jonah, what should we do so that the sea will calm down for us? For the sea was getting worse and worse. And he answered them, pick me up and throw me into the sea so that it will calm down for you. For I know that I am to blame for this great storm that is against you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to try to get back to dry land, but they they couldn't because the sea was raging against them more and more. So they called out to Yahweh, the Lord, Please, Lord, don't let us perish because of this man's life, and don't, don't charge us with innocent blood, for you, Lord, have done just as you pleased. Then they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, And the sea stopped its raging. The men were seized by great fear of the Lord, the God God of Israel, Yahweh, the real God. And they vowed a sacrifice to the Lord. They made vows to him. The Lord appointed a great fish, meanwhile, to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. God commissions the storm and the fish The ship and the sailors even follow his commands, just not his own prophet, his own people. How crazy, right? But it's still crazy today, and I think we can all see a part of ourselves in this prophet. Jonah has an honest, come-to-Jesus kind of moment. He says, yes, this is who God is, sailors. Yes, this this is my fault. Throw me over so you can make it out. It's through Jonah's sacrifice, not his stubbornness, that the outsiders turn to the Lord. But now, I need to take a a quick pastoral detour here when we get to this part of Jonah. For some reason, the Jonah hanging out in the belly of a big fish kind of thing is one of those Bible things that people point to to show, look, this is all just fairy tales, man. That doesn't happen. And if Jonah is obviously made up, then the rest of this is made up. But look, this would only be a problem if the Bible was trying to tell us, hey, people can survive in digestive fish fluid for three days. That happens all the time. That's totally normal. Except it's not trying to tell us that at all. I mean, nobody bats an eye when the Lord makes the ravens send food to the prophet Elijah when he's at his breaking point. Now, do ravens normally serve as pizza delivery men for people? No, okay? Was it a miracle? Yes. Is that a problem? Not for the God who, according to Jonah, made the skies and the seas and the earth and all the creatures in it. Is Jesus resurrecting from the dead a typical Sunday morning activity? No. 
is God limited by typical Sunday morning activities? No. Okay? So if we get that and we accept that core message of the gospel, believing that, then believing God could miraculously protect Jonah inside of a fish is nothing that should break any of our categories of what's possible or think, oh, it must be made up. Am I going to try to talk you through the science of how Jonah could have made it through and made it out of that fish if it was a whale or something? Maybe someone could. That's great. But I don't think that's really the point, and I think it misses the bigger issue. Okay, so for anyone who really struggles with that big fish thing, hopefully that frees you to not let it distract you from the point that God is actually trying to make with it. Even at Jonah's literally lowest point, his lowest point in the sea, in a fish, God is carrying him to Nineveh. God won't be stopped by Jonah. He won't even be stopped by the normal bounds of nature's routine. This fish is a protection for Jonah. It's not just a prison. It's an incredible grace. It's a mercy. It's another opportunity to turn to God, not just for the Ninevites, but for Jonah. Jonah got exactly what he wanted, to flee as far away from the Lord's mission as possible. He goes as far down as he can possibly go, and even lower than what's humanly possible, miraculously hitchhiking, hitchhiking a ride in a fish gut to take him beneath the waves. And yet, it was there that he came to his breaking point. It was there that he longed for the presence of the Lord that he'd been avoiding. Listen to the prayer that he prays in chapter 2. Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the belly of the fish. I called to the Lord in my distress, and he answered me. He uses the language of the Psalms to help his prayer. I cried out for help from deep inside Sheol, the grave. You heard my voice. You threw me into the depths, into the heart of the seas. The current overcame me. All your breakers and your billows swept over me. But I said, I have been banished from your sight. Yet I will look once more towards your holy temple. The water engulfed me up to the neck. The watery depths overcame me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. I sank to the foundations of the mountains, the earth's gates, shut behind me forever. Then you raised my life from the pit, Lord my God. As my life was fading, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you, to your holy temple. Those who cherish worthless idols abandon their faithful love, but as for me, I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. I will fulfill what I have vowed. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Then the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Jonah, who was doing his best to avoid the Lord, calls out to him. Jonah, who was running from God's mission, now accepts it as his own. Jonah's a complex person, he's not a hero. He's not a cartoon villain either. There's still a lot he's not getting right. He still puts a lot of distance between himself and, and those who cherish worthless idols, he prays in verse 8, not realizing those worthless idol worshipers back on the boat just vowed themselves to the Lord. But I do think this is an honest, refocused moment for Jonah. Even if it's short-lived, Jonah embraces the Lord and the mission the Lord gave him. It took a dramatic, sea-shaking, even miraculous twist to get him there. But for Jonah to personally embrace God's heart to reach out to his enemies was it important enough to the Lord for him to go to the lengths that we read about. 
Now think about this scripture that we've heard, this word of God so far halfway through the book. For a prophet who was supposed to be a messenger, a surprising amount of the book in his name focuses on him, Jonah, on his attitude and the lengths that the Lord goes to expose that in Jonah. Why? Why does it matter for Eastful Baptist, for you? When we talk about being on mission for Jesus together to reach the lost and the perishing with his good news, why does that focus on Jonah matter? It matters because it is part of God's mission to get his people on board. It is part of God's mission to get God's people on board with it. God is more concerned than we are to spread his own kingdom, redeem more people. He will not be stopped by his own people's laziness or apathy or fears or obstacles. When we don't go out in the world, he brings the world right to us. But one of the most amazing and emotional parts of the book of Jonah is that the Lord doesn't just pursue the sailors and the Ninevites and all those outsiders who Jonah is supposed to invite to turn to God. God also pursues Jonah, the messenger, with as much passion and concern as he pursues the people Jonah was sent to. Friends, we're not simply tools at God's disposal. He cares about our hearts, our motivations, our state of mind. Our souls still matter to Him, even while we talk about seeing other souls saved. It's part of God's mission to get His people on board. When you picture the movement of God's mission, do you picture an arrow running straight from Jesus to all the lost people of the world, skipping over you like a rainbow? Because that's not the movement of God's mission. That's not how it works, according to Jonah. It's pointed at us to make our hearts match God's hearts for the world. And it runs through us to the world around us. We don't get to say, oh, well, that's for the pastors and the missionaries and the especially energetic people who are just good at talking to people. I'm not good at talking to people. We don't get to say that. It's part of God's mission to get you on board with it. You're not just one more wallet to recruit, one more soldier in the army. You're part of the goal of this mission, to see your own passions transformed, to see what you love be what God loves, what you seek be what God seeks, to understand what it means to be a part of his kingdom and to spread it. I remember doing a lot with Jonah in Bible school and seminary. It seems like it's always the book that they make you study in all of your classes. I just remember really getting to the point, looking closely at it and being blown away God doesn't just care about what I'm training to do or the skills that I have or, or don't or the people I reach. He cares about me. Enough to have a whole book of the Bible about God chasing down this man who served him but just ran away. How gracious can he get? I mean, not that I ever consider myself like a prophet, but you know what I mean, right? It's not just God's mission to get me to do the right thing the most effective way. That's what I mean. It's part of God's mission to get me on board with it personally, to have my heart match His. He cares about that. He cares about me, and He genuinely cares about you, your goal, whether it's His goal to seek and save the lost. How gracious could he get, right? How good he is. Jesus told his followers, like we heard on Easter, go and make disciples of all nations. 
It's not just about the number of hands raised at rallies. It's not just about the remote countries, although that's important. It's God's mission to see more of the lost and the perishing find hope and life in Jesus. It's God's mission for His people to be a part of that movement, to build up people to be more like Jesus, even while that's happening in us. Are you open to the opportunities that God gives you to do that? Or are you avoiding them? I can't answer that question for you. But I can tell you that God cares about that. Because He cares about you. He loves like a good father, wanting your values to match His. God may be powerful enough to bring the world right to us, but it's part of his mission to bring us to the point where we're not waiting for that to happen or hoping that it doesn't. What opportunities do you have this next month, this summer, wherever you're going, whatever you're doing, to take steps forward in making disciples? What does it look like for you and the communities that you're a part of with the gifts that God gives you to Share the light of Christ with the world around you. Pray about that. Pray about that the way that Jonah prayed and called out to the Lord and refocused on him. Don't just keep your head down and try to stay in your lane. God's mission and the mission of this church is not simply to have you fund and appreciate all the people who get to do the ministry stuff as their full-time jobs. It's for us all to be on mission together. God cared enough about that to patiently, passionately chase Jonah down his escape hatch. And he cares enough about that to patiently, passionately chase us all down today and refocus us on his own heart for the world and have us share it. Let's pray to him now, together. Lord, we're blown away by your mercy. We're shocked at just about every other verse in Jonah, in the twists and turns, and the how could he's, and how could that. But at the end of the day, what we're most shocked by is the extent of your care, how much you notice, how much you pursue. Even this struggling runaway who booked a flight to the North Pole. Lord, thank you for how much you care about us, not just results. And what all the professionals are doing. What all the prophets who said, yes, use me, got to see happen. Lord, thank you for Jonah, the book. Thank you for who you are, for being gracious and kind and faithful to seek us out, to call us, to turn our hearts to you. Lord, help our mission to be your mission. Help us to care even a fraction of an amount as much as you do for the lost and needy of this world, the world right around us. Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, please show us what opportunities you put in front of us this next month, this summer, the places we're going, the people we talk with. Show us how to share the light of Christ with those around us. We pray that we would see that happen for our good and your glory. And that's all in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Well, I'd like to invite you to Stand and respond in one more way as we sing together. My Jesus, the kind of Lord that he is. And as always, if you ever want prayer, you're welcome to come forward with us uh, next to the altar. I'll be up here to pray with you as well.
Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all its healing. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. He makes a way where there ain't no way. Rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can't save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. And let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Amen. Who can wipe away the tears from broken dreams and wasted years until the past to disappear? Let me tell you about my Jesus and all the wrong turns that you would go and undo if you could. Who can work it all for your good? Let me tell you about my Jesus. He makes a way where there ain't no way. Rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can't save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and His grace is free. And the good news is I know that He can do for you what He's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. And let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Amen. Who would take? cross to Calvary, pay the price for all my guilty, who would care that much about me, let me tell you about my Jesus, so oh, he makes a way where there ain't no way, rises up from an empty grave, ain't no sinner that he can't save, let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and His grace is free. And the good news is I know that He can do for you what He's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. And let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, 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 let my Jesus change your life. Amen. You know, I was growing up, the church that I went to, uh, the, the church sign on the back that you saw as you were leaving, it said, you are now entering your mission field. So instead of just saying, go in peace, I'll see you next week. You know, may the Lord send us out from here into the mission field that we have and the communities that we're a part of. May the Lord help us to show his light to those around us. Amen. We'll see you next week.